Muy buenos días. La Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, a través de su Facultad de Derecho y de la sede UNAM Chicago, les da la más cordial bienvenida a este acto inaugural del webinar Aspectos Relevantes del Sistema Legal Norteamericano. Nos honran con su presencia en este presidio el doctor Guillermo Pulido, director de UNAM Chicago. Nos acompaña la doctora Guadalupe Fernández Ruiz, jefa de la División de Estudios de Posgrado de la Facultad de Derecho. Nos acompaña también el doctor Feldman Resnick, premio García Robles otorgado por la UNAM por su trabajo en defensa de los derechos de los migrantes. Asimismo, nos acompaña la doctora Rosa Carmen Rascón Gasca, coordinadora académica de la maestría y doctorado de la Unidad de División de Estudios de Posgrado de nuestra facultad. Nos honra con su presencia la doctora Erika Erani, coordinadora académica de UNAM Chicago. Asimismo, nos acompaña el maestro Marco Puentes Tamayo, coordinador de movilidad y servicios académicos de UNAM Chicago. Asimismo, está en esta sala virtual el maestro Alberto Conserrada, coordinador de vinculación cultural e institucional de la UNAM Chicago. Recibiendo el acto, nos honra con su presencia el doctor Raúl Contreras Bustamante, director de la Facultad de Derecho de la UNAM. El bienestar del pueblo está en la supremacía de la ley. Cicerón. Le pediremos al doctor Raúl Contreras Bustamante nos haga favor de dar unas palabras de bienvenida. Doctor. Muchas gracias, maestra Trinidad Ovilla. Muy buenos días tengan todas y todos ustedes. Saludo con especial afecto a quienes nos acompañan en este presidium virtual, en esta forma de comunicarnos que hemos aprendido de manera intensiva durante la pandemia y que ahora mantendremos porque efectivamente ha demostrado que es una forma de acercar las actividades académicas desde diversos lugares del mundo. Saludo también con especial afecto a quienes nos están viendo en vivo, estamos transmitiendo a través de la página oficial de Facebook de la Facultad de Derecho y también saludo a los 130 eh, alumnos inscritos en este webinar que se ha intitulado Aspectos Relevantes del Sistema Legal Norteamericano, que habrá de impartir como cátedra magistral el amigo de esta Facultad de Derecho, el doctor Kalman Resnick, quien, como ya lo decía la maestra Ovilla, es un catedrático de la UNAM Campus Chicago y recipendiario en 2017 del reconocimiento que la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México hizo en su favor con el premio Alfonso García Robles por su destacado trabajo en defensa de los migrantes latinos y en especial mexicanos en Estados Unidos. La verdad es que yo valoro mucho que podamos oír de una persona tan calificada, tan experimentada y tan autorizada para hacerlo, como lo es el doctor Kalman Resnick, sobre los aspectos relevantes del sistema legal norteamericano. Cuando estudiábamos derecho, este, quienes están conmigo en esta sala y, y quienes lo hayan hecho, eh, sobre todo en los últimos años del siglo pasado y ahora, siempre distinguíamos de manera muy clara que había dos grandes eh, familias del derecho en el mundo, la del derecho romano germánico, que es en la que México está adscrito, y desde luego, pues la, la rama de derecho eh, eh, que está rigiendo en Estados Unidos, que tiene sus orígenes anglosajones. Sin embargo, la intercomunicación que hay a través de la globalización de, lo, de, de, de los países, la intercomunicación, la llegada del Internet, el avance tecnológico en la comunicación ha hecho que estas dos grandes familias se comuniquen, interactúen y que cada vez se vayan fusionando y vayan teniendo más signos de identidad. Hoy 
En México, por ejemplo, el sistema penal acusatorio tiende a parecerse a, a la manera de impartir justicia penal en, en, en el mundo anglosajón, en Estados Unidos sobre todo, y pues en materia de comercio internacional, eh, muchas de las instituciones anglosajonas hoy están siendo adoptadas y aplicadas en los países latinoamericanos. Creo que en especial en estos temas que se van a ver, que tienen que ver con explicarle a los alumnos precisamente cuál es la estructura de gobierno, cuáles son las características de estos sistemas legales eh, norteamericanos y mexicanos, pues el, el especial énfasis en materia de ley de inmigración, en todas las cuestiones que tiene que conocerse y que tiene que entenderse para los efectos de la migración serán muy interesantes. Para nosotros nos parece que es lo más importante, además del contenido, el que sigamos construyendo estos puentes entre las instituciones académicas de ambos países. Siempre que vamos a Estados Unidos y lo hicimos en Chicago y lo hicimos en Boston, pues dejamos la inquietud en las instituciones de educación superior norteamericanas que vemos que hay centros de investigación sobre Asia, sobre África, sobre temas muy puntuales y casi no hay centros de investigación especializada con las relaciones entre Estados Unidos y México, a pesar de que compartimos 3.000 kilómetros de vecindad y a pesar de que hoy México es el socio comercial más importante de Estados Unidos arriba de China. Y creo que este tipo de actividades académicas va en ese sentido. Entre mejor nos conozcamos, entre más preparemos a los juristas de ambos países para intercomunicarnos, para conocer la naturaleza de nuestros socios y vecinos más importantes, creo que estaremos contribuyendo a generar no solamente una mejor relación entre los dos países, sino en crear un concepto de ciudadanía compartida en esta alianza estratégica que tenemos con Estados Unidos y con Canadá de convertirnos en la zona económica más importante del mundo, en tener una interacción y una fusión de sistemas y de prácticas jurídicas y sobre todo en construir un México y un Estados Unidos en donde reine una amistad fraterna, en donde haya paz social y donde el derecho pueda ser la, la forma en que resolvamos nuestras diferencias. Así que yo le agradezco a nombre de la Facultad de Derecho nuevamente a nuestro amigo Kalmar Resni que vuelva a darle algo de su muy valioso tiempo, de sus horas no facturables a la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de la Nación y nos ayude a construir esta nueva relación y a formar a nuevos juristas que seguramente habrán de ser gran utilidad para el problema migratorio que tenemos entre las relaciones de Estados Unidos y México. Muchas gracias, Guillermo, por hacer posible esta actividad. Muchas gracias, a Alberto Fonserrada, por el apoyo que siempre nos dan. Y muchas gracias a todo el equipo de UNAM Chicago por siempre apoyar a esta Facultad de Derecho. Que sea un webinar con un gran éxito, que estoy seguro que lo tendrán y que habremos de aprender todos de lo que habrá de enseñarnos el doctor Resnick. Muchas gracias a todos. Agradecemos el mensaje del doctor Raúl Contreras Bustamante, director de la Facultad de Derecho de la UNAM, y le pedimos a continuación al doctor Guillermo Pulido, director de UNAM Chicago, su mensaje de bienvenida. Muchas gracias, eh, Trilce. Este, doctor eh, Contreras, agradezco mucho tu mensaje. Eh, gracias, gracias por, por recibirnos en. En, la, en tu facultad, en Ciudad Universitaria. Eh, les doy las muy buenos días a, a todas y todos los académicos en este webinar internacional y, por supuesto, a la audiencia que nos, que nos acompaña. En UNAM Chicago hemos desarrollado estrechas colaboraciones con los diferentes facultades, escuelas e institutos de la UNAM las cuales se han concretado e impactado de manera positiva en la oferta académica que se ofrece a nuestra comunidad universitaria. Esta sede tiene un gran interés 
en seguir aportando a la formación académica y profesional de nuestros estudiantes y es así como producto de una estrecha coordinación con la Facultad de Derecho, hemos puesto en marcha diferentes programas y, pro y proyectos, tales como visitas profesionales para abogados, prácticas profesionales, servicio social a distancia, así como talleres, conferencias y webinars sobre temas de gran interés y suma trascendencia para una mejor formación de los profesionales del derecho. Ejemplo de esto es la mesa redonda que tuvimos el privilegio de realizar en el programa de diálogos del Bicentenario de las Relaciones Diplomáticas entre Estados Unidos y México sobre constituciones vecinas en las que participaron los doctores Emilio Rabaza y Ken Greenfield con la moderación de la maestra Trilce uh, Ovilla. La relación bilateral entre México y Estados Unidos es una de las más importantes del mundo por la trascendencia social y política que reviste para ambas naciones. Por esta razón, demanda a especialistas en derecho que conozcan la realidad del ejercicio profesional en ambos países y que sean sensibles al contexto jurídico actual. En ese sentido, el webinar que hoy inicia aportará nuevas perspectivas especialistas que viven en ambos lados de la frontera y al mismo tiempo se enriquecerán con las experiencias de nuestros académicos. Es por todo lo anterior que agradezco infinitamente al director de la Facultad de Derecho, el doctor Raúl Contreras Bustamante, y a la maestra Trice Ovilla Bueno, coordinadora de vinculación académica, así como a Marco Antonio Fuentes, coordinador de movilidad y servicios académicos de la UNAM Chicago, y al equipo de, de, de esta sede que nos acompaña. Por supuesto, a los brillantes conferencistas, nuestro querido amigo el doctor Kalman Rednick, Paul Lewis, Justin Swinsick, y por supuesto a Manuel González Oropesa por sus esfuerzos para, para la realización de este webinar sobre aspectos relevantes del ejercicio legal en los Estados Unidos, en el que se abordarán, como lo dije anteriormente, temas fundamentales sobre la práctica migratoria, la estructura política, la constitución de los Estados Unidos y aspectos generales de la práctica legal, así como las diferencias entre los sistemas legales de ambas naciones. Gracias a las y los asistentes por su interés y su participación, y les deseo un gran éxito en las sesiones que están por iniciar. Muchísimas gracias y mucho éxito. Muchas gracias por su mensaje, doctor Pulido. De esta forma llegamos al final de esta ceremonia de inauguración del webinar Aspectos Relevantes del Sistema Legal Norteamericano. Despedimos a nuestro amable presidium, que tengan un excelente día, muchísimas gracias, y les cedo el uso de la voz al maestro Marco Fuentes Tamayo para la moderación de la primera conferencia del doctor Resvictan. Que tengan todos ustedes muy buen día. Hello, good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us in this webinar series coordinated between UNAM Chicago and UNAM Law School. So our first lecturer is attorney Kalman Resnick. He's a shareholder with huge Sokol, Pierce, Resnick and Deem, and he's based in Chicago area. Mr. Resnick, is more than 40 years of experience as an immigration law practitioner and his vast knowledge of a multiplicity of immigration practice areas contributes to his ability to counsel and advocate for his clients in the field of immigration law. In addition to immigration law, Mr. Resnick practices in the areas of labor and employment law, civil rights, 
and constitutional law. Mr. Resnick has practiced immigration law since 1973. He has extensive experience in virtually every area of immigration practice, including business immigration, family unification, asylum and refugee matters, nationality and citizenship issues, employer sanctions and other employment related immigration matters and the defense of foreign nationals on the removal proceedings. He has litigated immigration cases before the US Court of Appeals, the US District Court and the Board of Immigration Appeals, including litigating Silva versus Bell, which resulted in the recap recapturing of thousands of visa numbers that were illegally charged against the Western Hemisphere, numerical limitation and the distribution of these numbers to, nat to natives of the Western Hemisphere awaiting immigrant visas. Upon graduation from law school in 1973, Mr. Resnick received a Reginald Hever Smith Fellowship to work at the 18th Street Neighborhood Legal Services Office of the Legal Assistant Foundation of Chicago. In 1976, he obtained private foundation funding to open the Legal Services Center of Immigrants, one of the nation's first legal services advocacy centers for immigrants' rights. Most recently, Mr. Resnick was awarded with Alfonso Garcia Robles Award from UNAM because of his outstanding career protecting undocumented communities in the US. Please note that after the lecture, I will open a brief space for questions and answers. Without any more further, I will turn it over uh, to Mr. Resnick for his lecture. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's great to be with you. I thought I was gonna be speaking in Spanish, but I guess I'm speaking in English. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I've had wonderful visits at the law school when I've been in Mexico City and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, what I really would like to do is have a conversation with you and with Marco, but let me tell you a little bit about my career. Um, and uh, I am just started my 50th year of legal practice and uh, I, be blessed by a career that has allowed me to work closely um, with the Mexican community in Chicago and other immigrant communities in the Chicago area and to learn from my clients all about the process of migrating, to learn about why they left uh, their countries of origin and why millions of Mexicans are now in the United States, um, their experience in Mexico, what caused them to leave and their experience in our country. Um, so what is really important to understand is uh, I became a lawyer because of my values, uh, progressive values, uh, my interest in uh, using uh, the laws to improve the rights of people who did not have equal rights in our society. Um, and when I graduated law school in 1973, I came at the University of Michigan, I came to Chicago, my home city where I was born, and was blessed with a job at the legal services program in the Mexican community in a neighborhood that's called Pilsen. Um, and at the time, there were uh, thousands of Mexicans coming, immigrating to the United States, most of them undocumented, uh, without documents, and they were coming to Chicago and looking for jobs, looking for, um, to support their families in Mexico and support, bring their families from Mexico to the United States. Um, and uh, there were very few lawyers practicing immigration law at the time. And so I learned the skills of an immigration lawyer um, because I wanted to help this growing community of immigrants in Chicago. And in the past 50 years, I've been able uh, to work with the community, not just in defending people's immigration rights, but also helping them expand uh, their political rights 
and economic rights within this society. Um, and uh, Latinos most uh, in Chicago now are one third of the population of the city and uh, a huge portion of the population of the state of Illinois. And they are now expert, increasing in political power within our city. Um, one of my former paralegals, Jesus Chuy Garcia, will be, um, is running for mayor uh, in the election uh, at the end of February, February 28th. Um, Chuy is from Los Pinos, Durango, came here when he was 10 years old, is now serving in the US Congress. Uh, previously, he was a state senator, and before that, uh, in the city council of Chicago. And Team Chuy is a group of primarily Latino uh, progressive political leaders who are now in various uh, representing the Latino community and uh, other immigrant communities in many bodies. And Chuy has been in Congress uh, since uh, 2019. So it's important to understand that as lawyers uh, in the United States, uh, um, many of us uh, who pursue careers in law that are related to our political values, our perspective towards the society. And I've been able to practice immigration law, but also work to empower the communities of immigrants that I represent. And to me, um, it, it's not just the practice of immigration law and defending my clients, but it's also expanding the rights of uh, the community, um, of immigrant communities that are so important to Chicago's economy and, uh, and, and the growth of our city. Um, in terms of the perspective towards the practice of immigration law, primarily immigration law is administrative law. That is, we work with the agencies that enforce immigration policy um, and define who can obtain legal status in the United States, who can obtain citizenship in the United States, um, and the rights of people who are here from, uh, who are foreign born. Um, but because of our complicated legal system, we have ways in which we can get into the courts both in challenging the laws, uh, whether they're constitutional, in challenging the policies as to whether or not they comply with the statutes and regulations and whether the regulations comply with the statutes uh, that are the immigration laws. Um, and also we have appeals. So we can go from uh, a immigration court case before an immigration judge to the Board of Immigration Appeals, then to the US Court of Appeals. And if permitted by the Supreme Court of the United States, we can appeal a decision to the, uh, the US Supreme Court. Um, we also have uh, practice at times uh, in areas of state law. Um, Illinois, because it is a state with many immigrants, and it, uh, we have uh, and, and immigrant communities that have political power um, has been able to pass a number of laws uh, at the state level that protect the rights of immigrants. Um, for example, Illinois no longer allows for the detention in, uh, in state facilities or local facilities of immigrants in facilities uh, that detained for the U U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So that is, was as, law, as a result of a law passed by the Illinois legislature and signed by the governor. Uh, Illinois also has laws that are protecting uh, immigrants who are without documents um, from uh, apprehension by uh, local police and, uh, uh, and state police. And um, so that basically, uh, the local authorities in Illinois and the state authorities are not in cooperating in the apprehension of undocumented immigrants with the federal government. Um, we also have established programs to provide health care um, to undocumented people. Um, 
I think what's fascinating to me is that so much of what we do in Illinois and others and in the United States with regard to immigration policy has a huge impact upon Mexico. And um, the, that's reflected in many different ways. Most importantly, with the question of remesas. Um, remesas are uh, the number one source of income for Mexico, um, number one source of foreign exchange, larger than petroleum, larger than tourism. It is number one. I think it's uh, 50, over $51 billion in the last year. Um, that's a huge amount of money, much of it coming from people who are um, undocumented um, and many of whom have been here for many years, but because of our harsh immigration laws, um, even though people are maybe married to US citizens, have children born here who are US citizens, cannot obtain legal status here. And one of my um, great hopes is that uh, our countries can work together to figure out a way to have a relationship which does not leave so many people exploited uh, in the United States who are unable to obtain legal status, unable to travel back and forth between our countries and have uh, been here for decades without documents because of our punitive immigration laws. Um, this is a civil rights issue. It, it is an issue of great importance to Mexico. It's an issue of great importance within our country. Um, Unfortunately, one of the major reasons we have this frozen immigration policy where we have more than 11 million people in our country without documents is the question of political rights. I don't believe that in the United States, there's a huge, uh, most people realize we need immigrants. Immigrants are an important source of labor. The real question in the United States are the political rights of immigrants um, and the impact on our society of changes in our population. Um, if not already, within the next 10 years to 20 years, a majority of the US population will be considered non-white. Um, that can include Latinos, includes Asians, includes African-Americans and people who've immigrated from other countries in the world. We're, and under our racialized system, um, we have a concern by some portions of our population, white population, of the changes in our society. Um, and the Republican Party has become the party of this, raising this concern of changes within our society. And the reason why we don't have changes in our immigration policies that would allow for people to obtain legal status who've been here working and contributing to our society is simply the political questions of the power that immigrants who become citizens or have a pathway to citizenship, how it will impact our politics um, and decrease uh, the, the power of those who are concerned about demographic change in our society. Um, in terms of the contributions that immigration lawyers can make to our society is to will help it Immigration is essential to American society because we have a shortage of workers in many areas of our economy. And what we do in trying to obtain legal status for people is to increase the ability of people to live the lives they should be able to live while working in the United States. Um, these are civil rights issues, issues that should be of concern to Mexico and the Mexican government and to the Mexican people. And I'm hopeful that um, with increasing numbers of people in both societies concerned about the well being of immigrants in our society, and particularly Mexican immigrants in our society, that we can establish a bilateral movement to secure the rights of uh, immigrants in the United States, uh, Mexican immigrants in, society, in the United States in particular. Marco, would you have some questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, not at this moment uh, that I'm, I'm I'm writing down all the questions that our audience has for you uh, by the end of the 
of the lecture. I mean, if that, that's okay for you. Yeah, I would be happy to. I think it's important. Do, do you have any questions that you've received so far? Not at this moment, but I'll let you know. Okay. So, you know, what is really, uh, one thing I want to point out to people, because I think it's critical to understanding our immigration situation. Um, at the very time, over the last 60 years, the U.S. has needed increasing amounts of foreign labor in, uh, to support its economy um, because of uh, an aging population, because of demographic changes in the United States, there was a, and the increasing rights of other populations which have been exploited historically, for example, African-Americans or native-born Latinos or women workers, all of whom gained rights in the 1960s through the civil rights movement and the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, employers were increasingly looking for foreign workers, and in particular, Mexican and Central American workers to support our economy. Um, and so uh, this need for foreign workers came at the very moment that we were also changing our laws to make it very difficult for immigrant workers from Latin America and the Caribbean to come here legally. Um, before July 1968, there were no limits on the numbers of Mexicans, the number of Central Americans, the number of South Americans, or the number of people from the Caribbean who wanted to come to the United States and obtain permanent residence and a pathway to citizenship. The first limitation was established in July 1968, and was 120,000 per year limitation on immigration from the Western Hemisphere. But very quickly, in 1977, we adopted a per country limit of 20,000 legal immigrants, uh, with some exceptions. And so Mexico has been limited to, uh, to approximately 20 to 25,000 um, legal immigrants per year, with some exceptions, uh, since uh, 1977. So we have a huge population of people who've come here illegally, who, who don't have any easy pathway to uh, obtain legal status in the United States. Um, some people are waiting in lines that are, because of these quotas, that are 20 years or longer to come legally to the United States. They may have parents who are US citizens um, or permanent residents. They may have brothers and sisters who are US citizens. They qualify to immigrate to the United States, but there's no pathway for until there's a visa number available and the visa numbers are backlogged up to 20 years. We also have a situation where we have penalties in our law since 1996 that make it very difficult, if not impossible for most uh, people who are in the United States illegally from Latin America to obtain legal status. So if you entered illegally the United States, you cannot obtain legal status in the country in most cases, with some exceptions. You have to leave the country to go to a counselor interview in your country of origin. However, um, once you leave the country, if you've been illegally in the country for more than a year or more, you're barred from returning for 10 years. We also have laws that now since 1996 penalize people who've entered the United States more than once illegally um, and have made it virtually impossible for people in that situation to obtain legal status with, or even apply for a waiver of the bar until they're outside the United States for 10 years. What so what we now have in the United States are mixed families. And many of my clients are from mixed families where you have a large number of families where some people are US citizens, some people are permanent residents, some people are undocumented, and some people may have temporary status under various laws. Uh, one of those groups is DACA recipients, who students who have, because of policies established by Barack Obama and continued by uh, since then 
uh, have status in the United States uh, because they came to the United States before they were 16. Um, that program is under threat. It's been being attacked, attacked by the Republican governors and attorneys generals in the courts. And sometime this year, we will be getting uh, a decision, we think, from the US Supreme Court as to whether the DACA program is, is legal and will be and whether and will be ended. The real problem that we face is that the US Congress is divided. Uh, the House of Representatives is uh, in control of the Republican Party uh, by several votes. Um, and the US Senate is in control of the Democratic Party. However, the Senate, the House uh, and Senate must agree on any changes in the law. And because of the division between the parties on this issue of immigration, the US Congress has not been able to enact a reform of our immigration laws that would provide legal status to the 11 million people who, or more who are undocumented, most of whom are Mexican. Um, so that political fight is a significant political fight, which unfortunately does not look like it will be resolved by the current Congress because of the political position of the Republican Party against um, any changes in our immigration laws that would benefit of the undocumented. Um, Marco, how are we doing? I'm doing wonderful, Kelman. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I have some questions for you Good. as you speak about immigrant uh, status. Uh, so the first question that our audience has for you is that, is there is there a website where a person can check information about his or her uh, immigration status during the 19s? In terms of their status as to what laws they may be benefit them? I think that the person meant uh, like, if you have like any deportation uh, records or uh, I mean your immigration record in general, Okay, there is there, there are various ways to access immigration. Um, if someone has had been put in removal proceedings, there is a, a um, way through the website of the immigration court uh, or an 800 number, both of which are easily available to find out the status that of a case that was begun, whether it's been concluded, whether the person was ordered deported, ordered to leave voluntarily, granted relief from deportation, all of those things are available uh, online through the A number, which is a uh, number that is assigned cases that by the immigration authorities and used by the immigration courts. In terms of records that someone may have, with the agency, there's a way in, if the, someone was stopped at the border and not allowed into the United States, for example, there's the Freedom of Information Act and the Freedom of Information Act allows people, regardless of their citizenship or legal status to apply for uh, records that an agency of the federal government has. Um, and th those requests can be filed through uh, records regarding people's apprehension at the border or at airports in the United States can be obtained under the Freedom of Information Act through the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And the website of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection explains how Freedom of Information Act requests uh, should be filed. If the records are with Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, the records can be obtained through those agencies, through the US Customs and Immigration Service. Um, and the website for that agency explains the process, what needs to be submitted to make a Freedom of Information Act request. Thank you. Uh, just a, a reminder uh, before the next question, uh, just a reminder for all the all the public you can you can ask your question either in spanish or in english and and, and the staff will be 
uh, eager to see your question and then send it to me. It could be in Spanish or English. Uh, so the second question, Kelman, is in your opinion, is the current overpopulation in the US uh, the most important factor in establishing immigration controls or it's just a matter of old fashioned politicians? Well, I'm not sure that we have, uh, I don't believe we have overpopulation in the United States. Um, what we have are a political divide uh, over demographic changes and how we react to those demographic changes. Race in America is a very important issue. Historically, um, from the beginning of the society uh, of our country, we've had this issue with race. It was, um, we enslaved uh, people from Africa and uh, hundreds of years people lived in our country before it was a country when it was a colony and then after it was formed for the first uh, hundred years, uh, we enslaved a large portion of our society based on their color, based on their being brought here as enslaved people. Um, what has happened since then is that the debate over race has continued um, and we racialize uh, our populations. Asians and Africans were not allowed to immigrate to the United States uh, for many, many years until 1965 when we changed our immigration law. There was basically a ban on migration from Asia and Africa to the United States. Um, we have changed those laws, we changed those laws in 1965 with regard to increasing the ability of people from Asia and Africa, um, people of color to come to the United States. However, uh, with regard to Latin America, we have, and the Caribbean, we've made it more difficult to come to the United States by establishing these uh, laws that decrease legal immigration and um, based and made it impossible for people, most people who come here illegally to ever obtain legal status. Um, I think it's a game because in reality, our society is dependent upon the labor of these undocumented people. And what is really being uh, the source of the problem is the political rights of the undocumented people and immigrants. We need more workers in our society. Our population is aging. Um, and without more workers, we're going to have serious economic problems. But the political issue of the rights of immigrant workers and a pathway to permanent residence and citizenship is what this is all about. It's not about overpopulation. It's about political rights and this sense of some portion of the white population in the United States that they're threatened by demographic change and becoming a minority. And that has become the political position of the Republican Party, not just the Trump people, but generally the party. And uh, whereas the Democratic Party has become more and more open to the importance of migration and the rights of immigrants um, and is supported by the a uh, vast majority of people who are people of color. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about that, uh, Kalman. Uh, you're speaking about the importance of immigration law in the US, uh, but we wanna know what role does the Mexican lawyer plays in immigration in, in your country, in the US? I mean, do you think it is important to have more lawyers from Mexico uh, that are capable and has the ability to litigate immigration issues, or do you think that they should stay in Mexico? Or what what is your opinion on on the Mexican lawyers? Well, the role of Mexican lawyers who are not lawyers in the United States in our immigration system. Um, is quite limited in terms of the actual representation of people in the United States who are undocumented. 
Mexican lawyers certainly can help people who are in Mexico and have family members in the United States obtain legal status um, and assist lawyers in the United States with the processing of the paperwork. Also, as you know, Marco, there are issues of cases. We have a case right now involving an adoption in Mexico by a U.S. citizen and whether that adoption could be the basis of um, a person obtaining uh, permanent residence and U.S. citizenship in the United States. There's overlap in which cases that we work on as U.S. immigration lawyers have connect have the rights of immigrants may depend or the right to immigrate may depend on how, how the laws in other countries affect the immigration process, including Mexico. Um, another area is criminal convictions and whether a criminal conviction in Mexico could impact the right of a person to obtain permanent residence or U.S. citizenship. Um, I think what is I think more most important is to understand the significance of our economic relationship between our societies um, and how to build a civil rights movement between our countries to defend the rights of Mexicans in the United States. When Mexico's number one source of foreign exchange is the remesas, the remittances sent by Mexican workers in the United States home uh, to their families and their communities, that's an important economic issue. And the rights of those people who are sending those remittances and supporting the Mexican economy, supporting their families, and some supporting rural areas of Mexico are super important. Um, when we, you know, one of the reasons why we, Mexico has so many of its citizens in the United States was the impact of Taucan, which we call NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, the result of that agreement, which went into effect, I believe, on January 1, 1994, was the uh, to eliminate many jobs in agriculture in Mexico because Taucan has allowed for the importation of American agricultural products to Mexico. And because of the importation of corn and wheat and uh, sugar and other uh, crops that are produced very uh, cheaply in the United States due to our large amount of flat land and the economic uh, the agribusiness's ability to produce these crops uh, in the United States, large numbers of Mexicans lost their jobs in rural Mexico and uh, came to the United States. That's, at the very point we were making it very difficult to immigrate to the United States uh, legally, we had these large populations of people leaving Mexico because of the impact uh, of Talcan on the Mexican economy. Um, so my perspective is, is that, you know, these laws, this, this is a bilateral problem, a problem that requires a political solution. And it's not just a political solution uh, that can be reached by the U.S. Congress. It should be a political solution that is bilaterally uh, negotiated and fought for. And I think it's important that um, to recognize the importance of the Mexican economy of the Mexican immigrants, many of whom are undocumented, how difficult it is for those families to be split within the family and separated from their family in Mexico, unable to travel freely between our two countries. Um, and those issues are political issues and lawyers always can speak to political issues. Um, um, and so I would hope that, that we could find ways for, um, to work between our two countries towards changes in these laws um, that make, have made for this population of undocumented in the United States. We also have an increasing number of Mexicans coming to the United States because of violence in Mexico, because of 
criminal organizations that have made life in Mexico impossible for growing numbers of people. Um, and that is a real concern. And we, the problem of criminal organizations is, is a problem of two countries. Uh, it's the problem of the US and uh, the importation of illegal drugs from Latin America and from Mexico. It's a problem of the large amounts of arms that are taken from the United States, uh, produced in the United States um, and sent to Mexico um, uh, by illegal means. Um, these issues are bilateral issues that need to be worked on together. Um, the fact that people are, are coming to the United States because of uh, difficulties in Mexico, economic difficulties, the difficulty of supporting your family in Mexico, the difficulty of obtaining quality education for children, and the violence in Mexico, those are reasons why people are continuing to come to the United States, and most migration is undocumented. So what I really want to encourage is that you, um, that we look at these problems as uh, problems that we need to work on together, um, and progressives in both societies need to find ways to reach, to advance the agenda of justice for Mexicans in both the United States and in Mexico. Uh, these are issues that cry out for our cooperation between people in both countries and lawyers can play a very important role in that. Um, and uh, it's interesting, uh, we, the U.S. Congress has a growing number of uh, Latinos in the U.S. Congress. Um, Chicago now has Chuy Garcia, who's uh, a Mexican immigrant, and we have a second Latino, a Latina, uh, who his family is from Guatemala, Delia Ramirez. But that is true uh, throughout our country. We have growing empowerment of Latino communities in the United States and growing representation in the US Congress. And I look forward to great political change as immigrant communities and the descendants of immigrants gain more power in the United States. Um, and I think it's going to open the door to a uh, more bilateral relationship between our countries and uh, a more equitable and just relationship between our countries. Yes, we agree. Uh, these issues are definitely something that Mexico and U.S. should address because, uh, like you said, remittances are really important for Mexico and the work that the undocumented people uh, do here in the U.S. It's also re really important for the for U.S. economy and Mexico's economy. So I got two more questions, uh, and the first one is. Do you think that the welfare payments for citizens are a major factor for private companies needing immigrant workforce due to citizens not wanting to actually work because they have their needs fulfilled with the said payments? Well, first of all, our, uh, unlike many places in Europe, um, the US does not provide um, significant support for families. We have eliminated uh, over the last 25 years um, many of the welfare programs. Um, we continue to tie health insurance to employment, for example. Um, we uh, and, and so um, one of the issues is is not is it I, I don't think that the employment of people in uh, the United, the, the welfare system is a major reason why people are not working. What is a problem in the United States is people wanting uh, is their rights as workers, that is uh, low pay, um, our Congress is, the, the US Congress has not increase the minimum wage, which is ridiculously low um, for uh, many, many years because of political divide between the parties. Um, some st many states have 
increase the minimum wage over what is the federal minimum wage. But what is, is a huge problem is that uh, people want to be paid fairly for their work. Um, and we also have uh, a health care system which is extremely expensive. Um, and so what workers, immigrant workers provide is not just cheap labor, but it's also productive labor. Um, and one of the factors in, uh, that makes immigrant labor productive when the labor is undocumented is people don't have a lot of options. And when they get a job, they need to keep it and they work really hard to keep those jobs because of their undocumented status and the fact that they can't easily look for another job. Um, so the exploitation of labor is a problem um, in terms of uh, what the rights are of those workers and the fact that there are um, those jobs for someone who is a US citizen, they don't want to work at those jobs because of the level of exploitation, the dangers of those jobs. Um, and so take an industry like meatpacking, um, it, it's a very dangerous business and uh, with very difficult working conditions. And in, very few Americans want to work in a meatpacking plant earning what a meatpacker um, earns. And so, yes, there is a problem of uh, not caused by our welfare system, but really by inequities in how we treat working people, the failure to pay living wages to people, and uh, the dangers of, of certain industries. Thank you, Kalman. Uh, you know, the, the last question would be, in your opinion, how does the NAFTA uh, has impacted on the immigration uh, on, on the US and, 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 and Mexico? And also, how's the, how has the NAFTA impacted on the, on the labor, uh, labor dumping uh, in Mexico? I'm not sure what you mean by labor dumping. Yeah, like um, like uh, people uh, that are leaving Mexico because here in the U.S. they they have more more uh, opportunities in the in the field, uh, but in Mexico, you know, the field is completely abandoned uh, because uh, they don't have the same opportunities in Mexico as they have here. So, does the NAFTA has something to do with this uh, social? Uh, migration or it's just completely? I think, you know, one of the things that many people uh, in Mexico City fail to realize um, is that large parts of Mexico were dependent upon uh, agricultural production by small farmers. Um, and those jobs in much of Mexico were eliminated by the importation of American agricultural products after NAFTA was, Khan became, uh, went into effect. In the US, many companies have closed in the United States, unionized, many unionized uh, factories were closed um, and reopened in Mexico. Um, so much of the car industry, the automobile industry, my good many parts of American cars are now produced in Mexico. Um, what I, I'm not an expert on the Mexican economy, but from what I understand, you know, the ability of workers in these plants that the US uh, uh, moved US manufacturers uh, and multinational corporations moved to Mexico to get better wages is quite limited. So in part because uh, the rights of workers to effectively organize unions in Mexico and to use that representation to improve their salaries um, is has been limited. And in part because the Mexican economy is such that the value of the peso keeps being reduced next to the dollar. And as a result, people may 
get their salaries are not supporting them uh, the way they need to support them in the level of uh, uh, a decent support for a family. So, you know, the jobs that have been produced in Mexico for Mexican workers um, are not paying the wages that support families well. I think another problem in Mexico that is needs to be talked about more is the failure of the society of Mexican government to invest in rural areas and in poor communities um, in urban areas because you know, the, the school systems in Mexico available the public school systems are not providing the quality of education that allows people to move up uh, uh, economically within the society. Uh, you know, what is simply amazing is even, despite all the discrimination in the United States against Mexican immigrants and Latino immigrants, Mexican, uh, the, the children of Mexican immigrants are doing incredibly well in our society. Um, the, despite the, the relative challenges of going to school in a, uh, our uh, in, in immigrant communities, Mexican children, Mexican American children are doing incredibly well in our school system and advancing quickly into occupations and fields that they never would have been able to in Mexico had their parents not moved to the United States. Um, and so part of the reason why people continue to want to come here is because the educational system provides opportunities that are very difficult to find in rural Mexico or in poor communities in Mexico. Um, I don't think, you know, what's most important, I think, uh, point that I wanna make is that these are bilateral problems. Uh, yeah, we we uh, allow for the free exchange of capital between our countries, um, but we don't make it easy for to exchange labor because we don't allow for legal status to people who leave Mexico and go to the United States. Uh, and so um, we need to establish bilaterally uh, protections for uh, that protect workers regardless of where they're working. Um, and uh, NAFTA, uh, Talcan, uh, many has uh, provided some opportunities, but also many challenges. And I think we need to more openly discuss those. I think institutions like UNAM um, can do a lot more um, to uh, raise the issues of concern of migration and how it impacts the Mexican society, what it means to have a society where the number one source of foreign exchange are, remiss are remesas, uh, remittances. Uh, what it means for Mexican society to have such a large portion of the Mexican people in the United States, um, and what it means uh, for Mexicans, Mexico to have a growing number of Latinos in the U.S. Congress, and how that may impact the political relationship between and economic relationship between our societies. Um, I think I, I criticize both societies, both the U.S. and Mexico. Um, and those of us who are committed to wanting to establish uh, more equity in the relationship and more justice for people uh, as immigrants and as workers to work together between our societies. U.S. Um, institutions of learning, uh, universities also need to do a better job. Uh, and I think one of the wonderful aspects of uh, uh, UNAM having branches in the United States is the uh, the opportunity to have bilateral addressing of these issues um, by education by universities, and I think that is a welcome development. I know that UNAM in Chicago now has a relationship with the University of Illinois, um, but I think it's critically important that these programs uh, look at both societies and how uh, migration and the economics of two societies uh, and the needs of two societies can find ways to work together to improve opportunities in both countries.
Yes, we agree. Uh, education is it's just key for for addressing these these issues. And as a law as a law students like our audience and as a as a lawyers, uh, we should be very concerned about these uh, bilateral protections that you mentioned for the undocumented people and the importance of migration and its impact on both nations, in Mexico and in, in US. So uh, we really appreciate uh, your time and that you have shared this knowledge with us. Uh, I think that our community would be really satisfied because they heard some uh, about the importance of immigration and and you know the basics of immigration and uh, like the like the law school dean said you have been a really important ally for UNAM Chicago and UNAM uh, in general for addressing these kind of issues and for uh, staying in contact with all the community of UNAM and we deeply appreciate your your time and your support in this, Kelman. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. So uh, that will be all for the day. Thank you so much uh, for all the audience. Uh, we're looking forward to having you tomorrow for the next uh, lecture, uh, which be uh, about uh, US government and the US constitution by Paul Lewis uh, from the University of Illinois. So thank you so much for being here. And stay tuned. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much.